it's been in the back of my mind for quite a while, you know, the whole climate change debate, uh, environmental issues growing, pollution. So I've always felt very strongly about it and, and I've been watching very carefully what others have been doing. And for me, over the last few years, the, the sort of the urgency and the positivity, um, particularly the positivity around the debate has been missing. It's been very negative. Understandably, it's, it's such a large issue that everyone feels completely overwhelmed by the facts, the, the, the scale of the problems and things like that. So we wanted to break it down and try and work out how could we add something that was going to create action, create positivity, create energy towards actually solving some of these problems. And I think for me, it sort of formulated and sort of cemented itself a bit in my mind in Namibia about three years ago. I love community conservation and Namibia have been some of the sort of world leaders in, in community conservation. And for people who don't know what that is, it's, it's effectively the locals, um, wherever you are in the world, taking uh, an interest in, in management of the wildlife, nature, the environmental assets around them. So they very much manage them, they protect them, they nurture them um, for their own prosperity. And for me, that you know, I came away having met loads of good people there and I felt really inspired, really energised by what I'd seen. But then coming back to the UK and seeing the headlines around the world and you know, the media also like to concentrate sometimes on the, on the negativity. And I felt you know, you're losing people every single time you have those headlines. We all get that there's a really big urgent message. And, and you know, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about the urgency or the, or the, um, the big issues. But ultimately, if we want to tackle this, if we want to get on the front foot, we've got to bring people with us. And people have got to feel like there's, a, there's hope, there's a chance we can fix this. And that's what the Earthshot Prize is about, is providing those solutions to some of the world's biggest environmental problems. And so is the, is the dream that, that kind of the award show calendar goes BAFTAs, Oscars, Earthshot? Well, I think it should go Earthshot, BAFTAs, Oscars. <laughs> but, <laughs> so it depends when the, your it year depends, starts. Exactly. Uh, no, I mean, you know, it, the idea is to make the, uh, the Earthshot Prize the biggest, you know, global environment prize in history. And I think it, 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 we've, we've got time on our side. This is the right time to do this. We've got 10 years of critical... Uh, time where we have to be making inroads and finding these solutions and inspiring people that we can fix these solutions because past 2030 things get you know rapidly worse very quickly. And of course it's called the Earthshot and as soon as you hear Earthshot you think oh Moonshot and JFK. Absolutely uh, so the original kind of genesis of this is to try and capture the ingenuity and the problem solving and the, the ambition of the Moonshot and so you know based on JFK's idea to get a man on the moon all those years ago and you know all the technology and all the advancements that came out of trying to get a man on the moon, like solar panels, cat scanners, you know, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, we're trying to galvanise and, and push um, solutions forwards. And I think for me particularly, the idea that this space race is on at the moment. We've seen everyone trying to get space tourism going. It's the idea that we we need some of the world's greatest brains and minds fixed on trying to repair this planet, not trying to find the next place to go and live. And I think that's that ultimately is what sold it for me, is that that really is quite crucial. We need to be focusing on, on this one rather than giving up and, and, and heading out into space to try and uh, think of solutions for the future. Mm. Having said that, though, would you like to be a space tourist one day? I, do you know what? I have absolutely no uh, interest in going that high. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a pilot, but I'm a helicopter pilot, so I stay reasonably close to the ground. <laughs> I've been up to 65,000 feet once in a, in a plane, and that was truly terrifying. Right. And that's high enough. You, do you go weightless at that point? Not no. quite, but the sky is black above you, and you can right. see the curve of the Earth. Yeah. That's close enough to space for me, because yeah. you can come back down again. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's in the orbit, so it's okay. Also, but. I dread to think, what is the carbon footprint? of like a rocket going into space for 10 minutes. That is also, yeah, fundamental question. Yeah. And is the idea that, that, that basically you're, you're a technological optimist and actually in an ideal world, technology, politics and business can look after all of this stuff for us and, and you and I as individuals maybe actually might not need to change our lives that much? Absolutely, Adam. So that is the key, is that it's, about, it's about inspiring and finding solutions um, that can be around us you know, right now and hopefully in, in the future rather than just the debate concentrating on what we need to give up, what we can't do, which is very negative. And all of us, you know, as much as we will try, even if all of us did a little bit here and there to, to change our ways, it still isn't going to be enough. That's the thing I think we have to get across. That this is, this is a big challenge. This is a big task we're about to take on. And I think we need heroes. We need those people who uh, really have got vision, who've got ambition, energy to step up, come forwards. And, and give us solutions. And it's not just about technology, as you pointed out. The Earthshot Prize isn't just about technology. There are plenty of technological solutions we can celebrate, but it's about thinking differently. It's about thinking outside the box. It's about doing stuff in a different way that makes us 
richer, healthier uh, and happier in the future. Um, you talked about future generations. We're always then in this debate talking about what it means for, for our kids. I don't have kids, you have kids. I mean, what, what do you say to your children about this? I think they, they, are, they are living and then growing up in a world where it's, it's much more talked about than you know, when we were growing up. So that has benefits and that has negatives as well because you know, we are seeing a rise in, in climate anxiety. You know, people, young people now are growing up where their futures are basically being threatened the whole time. It's very unnerving and it's, it's, it's very you know, anxiety making. Um, growing up, you've got to worry about a job, you've got to worry about family life, you've got to worry about housing, you've got to worry about all these things. And you're putting in the climate, the very thing that we live, breathe and walk around in on top of that. So no wonder we're having a lot of you know, mental health concerns and challenges coming along. Now, I also believe that the younger generation are going to lead this and are going to dominate this. I mean, we can't not. And wherever we go and speak to young people, they're all very concerned about the environment. I mean, they love it. You know, children love being outdoors. They love getting money. They love playing and then chasing and playing sport and all that stuff. And I think they have a truer appreciation of what we're going to miss and what we're letting down than actually many of the adults. And that's where the, a bit of the disconnect is happening, is that those adults um, in positions of responsibility are not channeling their inner child to remind themselves, remember how much it meant to be outdoors and, 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 the, and what we're robbing those future generations of, of that outdoor childhood. Have your children got to the age where they're starting to nag you about this? Because quite often that's the way it, round it works. Yeah, so George at school recently has been doing litter picking and I didn't realise, but talking to him the other day, he was already showing that he was getting a bit confused and, and a bit sort of annoyed by the fact they went out litter picking one day and then the very next day they did the same route, same time, and pretty much all the same litter they picked up were back again. And I think that for him, he was trying to understand how and where it all came from. He, he couldn't understand. He was like, well, we clean this. Why is it not, why has it not gone away? And, you know, if we look at it like that, you start to realise, if you go back to the childhood, you go, wow, yeah, this is, this is where we should be at. We've got to be asking ourselves these questions. Why, why is that OK for that litter to come straight back again 24 hours later? But is he also then starting to ask questions about how he lives his life and the resources that he uses and what his impact on the planet is? I like, think, like we're all having to do. Yeah, I think... I think a definite sense of realisation and understanding. So the education piece is really key. So for instance, you know, not overusing water, you know, being careful with our resources, turning off light switches, things like that, which you know, was instilled in, in, in me growing up. Um, these things, you know, we're, we're now having to extrapolate them bigger and bigger. So yes, he's acutely aware, more so than the other two at the moment. Charlotte's still a little bit young, she's still not quite sure. Um, and actually Louis just enjoys playing outside the whole time, so he lives outside. Um, but I think it is slowly dawning on them that, that, that these things matter. But I think when you're that young, you just want to have fun and enjoy it. And I feel bad, I don't want to give them, I don't want to give them the burden of, of that, that worry. Mm. And I suppose going in the other direction, your dad has been worried about this stuff for a very long time. And actually people used to sort of take the mickey out of him a little bit for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's been, it's been a hard road for him. Uh, my grandfather started off um, helping out WWF a long time ago with um, its nature work um, and, and biodiversity. And I think that my father's sort of progressed that on and talked about climate change a lot more uh, very early on before anyone else thought it was a topic. So yes, he's had a, he's had a really rough ride on that. And I think you know, he's been proven to have been well ahead of the curve, um, well beyond his time in, in, in warning about some of these dangers. But it shouldn't be that there's a third generation now coming along, uh, having to ramp it up even more. And you know, for me, it'd be an absolute disaster if George is sat here talking to you or your success, Adam. You know, in another thirty years' time, whatever, still saying the same thing because by then we're, we'll be too late.